Hi everyone, thank you for watching my presentations. Today I want to talk about Nozinine. Nozinine with the generic name Levomipromazine, or some will call it Metotrimeprazine. Well, you might be familiar with this medication. If you are not, then let's go. If you are familiar with it, maybe you still get one or two facts. Okay, let's go. Levomipromazine is an aliphatic phenotyazine that will antagonize D1 and D2 dopamine receptors of types. It also binds to alpha 1, alpha 2, and muscarinic 1, and muscarinic 2. It's a first generation antipsychotic. It's an analgesic, at the same time, anti emetic. Mosinam is the one that I'm familiar with, but could also you know, be available as metoprazine, novomeprazine, or PMS, metotrimeprazine, depending on your jurisdiction and the available pharmaceutical company in your region, where Nozinan is the one I'm familiar with. Could be used as anxiolytic. So, someone is having anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder, you can prescribe this. At the time we are done with the entire presentation, you will be able to make up your mind if this is what you are going to go for, if you are going to be comfortable or not, you know that after. If someone is having emotional disorder secondary to physical conditions, Nozina will be fine. And for another individual with autonomic disturbances or insomnia, be used as an agent, as anti-emetic for people having nausea and vomiting. For pain, pre-operative or post-operatively, you can use nosinam. Also in the psychotic world, particularly individuals with schizophrenia, nosinam will be fine. And sinai psychosis, manning depressive syndrome, or chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Could be available in form of injections as 25 mg per meal or in form of tablets 2 mg, 5 mg, 25 mg, or 50 mg. Could be given per aura, intramuscularly, intravenously. Also, cutaneous infusion in sterile water or normal saline is possible. The dosage and the dosage that I want to talk about right now will be only in adults. If you're handling psychotic situations, you can give 25 mg per hour, BID or TID, or via any route you want, but if it's in severe pain, you can also give as 25 milligram BID or trice daily. If you're handling insomnia, you can give 10 to 25 milligram at hour of sleep. If the problem is nausea or vomiting, you can give 6 milligram twice daily or three times daily. In the injection form to give subcutaneously, particularly if you're handling palliative care cases, you give very low dosage. You give as 3.12 milligram BID or one daily bolus or palliative care 6.25 milligram to 250 milligram in normal saline continuous infusion. And of course, you know, you give that very slowly. 
intramuscularly for pain management, we could go for 10 to 25 milligram every eight hours. And for children on adolescent, uh, palliative care, we could have even a fusion of 0 0.06 to 5 milligram per kilogram. I put that in D5 at rate of 250 mL slowly, given as 20 to 40 drops per minute. Let me repeat. If you are giving it an infusion for palliative care, you're handling children and adolescents, pick 0 0.0625 milligram per kilogram and get your D5 water. Get 250 ml of D5, and when you hook it up, let it be 20 to 40 drops per minute. Warning. Though I'm not a military guy, so I don't have reason to warn anyone or give order, but for the sake of the safety of every individual that will be passing through our the practice, we need to take note of certain things. As far as this medication is concerned, it's not the best for elderly people, particularly those with dementia. And why? Avoid this medication in elderly because of the possibility of increased risk of stroke. And not only stroke, there's possibility of cognitive impairment. They will not be able to make function, no, functional decisions again, and it could even lead to mortality if they have dementia. It should be given at the lowest effective dose for the shortest period of time. If at all, you must give it. There will be more troublesome syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone in elderly. Therefore, we need to monitor the sodium level before initiating the medication, during the time that the individual is taking the medication, and when you are telling off. Never give this medication in anyone with breathing disorders. Be careful in those with cardiovascular diseases. There's a high risk of death in those with dementia. I've just said that. Never an hepatic failure. Never any respiratory failure. Never in seizure disorders. Someone will ask me, then why give you the medication at all? But this is not the groove that we're going to find all human beings on earth, no. What are the possible side effects? There's the likelihood of life-threatening arrhythmias. Prolonged QT in some people. Prolonged QT will lead to possible ventricular tachycardia. Actually, from prolonged QT, it will lead to tosadi point. From tosadi point to ventricular tachycardia, from ventricular tachycardia to ventricular fibrillation, from ventricular fibrillation to asystole, and of course, the grave. So it has anticholinergic effects, could give constipation, blood vision, dry mouth, renal retention because of the anticholinergic effects. There's possibility of a granulocytosis, neutropenia. Still on side effects, could cause CNS depression. So, anyone on this medication could not operate machines. There's likelihood of osophagia dysmotility and high aspiration. And from that, could be aspiration pneumonitis or aspiration pneumonia. And that on its own could kill. There's likelihood of extra pyramidal symptoms because if you have followed this presentation from the beginning, I have named it as first generation antipsychotics in the group of phenotyazins. So with extra pyramidal symptoms, they could have acute dystonia, acathesia, tardive dyskinesia, or Parkinsonism, and there's likelihood of hyperglycemia. 
hyperplatinemia, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, retinopathy, and autostatic hypotension. We have to see in men, temperature dysregulation, venous thromboembolism leading to pulmonary embolism, tachycardia, and diaphoresis. Pans atopenia and bleeding, hepatotoxicity and photosensitivity. In pregnancy and breastfeeding women, withdrawal symptoms are possible in a newborn. So discuss with your OBGYN and pharmacist. Monitoring. Let's go clockwise. From one o'clock, you monitor the liver function test, the body mass index, vital signs, extrapyramidal symptoms, visual with ophthalmologist every year, fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, at the beginning of the medication, administration, and then every year. Fasting lipid every six months to every one year. Drug drug interaction, that is in conclusion, I will just refer you to your local pharmacist. Okay? They are brilliant people, they'll be able to guide you because the list is just too long and I can't go over them. Even if I go over those ones available through the literature, there may be more. So I don't want to you know, put myself in a box when it, com when it comes to drug drug interaction and this medication. So contact your pharmacist or some other colleagues. We now have come to the end of this very presentation. Please remember to subscribe to my channel so that you can get these presentations immediately they are published. I appreciate it.